Okay, so we're going to start a new section, um, final section in this class actually, looking at global environmental problems that have an international cooperation component or may require international cooperation to respond to going forward. And I'd like to start this conversation by talking about this idea of a common pool resource regime, which I think dovetails really nicely with conversations we had um, in previous classes about international cooperation through international organizations. And maybe that's one way to think about common pool resource regimes as sort of a horizontal system for global governance. So we'll begin with uh, maybe introducing two important environmental problems that we kind of talk through with, um, with metaphors or with, with catchy phrases. So one of these is the Malthusian trap. And this is uh, named after a guy, uh, Thomas Malthus, we'll go with Thomas, um, who was a historian slash economist. It was actually before they really made distinctions between these sorts of fields, um, who looked at agricultural production over human history, and he noted a really disturbing and kind of terrifying trend. He noted that over human history, there have been these, these incredible um, successes in agricultural production, right? Things like crop rotation and fertilizer and using animals to cultivate more land and heavier plows and, and then levels of, of mechanization. And that allowed for greater amounts of food to be produced in the same amount of land and you would assume that that would lead to an increase in human well-being and prosperity. And as Thomas Malthus dug into the data, what he found is that that wasn't the case. And that what ended up happening is that you would get a new technology that would improve food production. And for a short period of time, things would get better. Uh, but then people would stop starving to death in the winter and babies would stop dying from malnutrition and people would live longer. And before you know it, within a generation, the population had grown to a point where all of that extra food production was being consumed. and The population was again sitting on the edge of starvation. And Thomas noticed this pattern over and over and over throughout human history. And it very much alarmed him that human beings appeared to be trapped in this dynamic where whatever gains in food production were seen ended up resulting in a population surge that would essentially eat up all of those gains and leave human beings in a permanent state of um, near starvation. Right? So this is the, the trap that, that Thomas Malthus sort of laid out. Um, and he sort of sketched forward and said that this is going to be worse in the future. And you might think that this would be the case, except that in the last hundred years or so, investment and in resources or in, in research has managed, particularly in the area of food, to be able to keep pace with global population growth. Um, and so this is something that, that folks who think about environmental problems oftentimes worry about. Is that sustainable? Can that continue? How do human beings manage the balance between um, population and consumption versus what we're able to actually produce and extract? So that's one problem that we'll be circling back through and kind of ties into this problem of the tragedy of the commons. This is also something that sort of has a, a metaphor from history um, that we use, and it's, it's based in the story of the English commons, which were sort of collectively held areas where you could graze animals. And the concern in, in the story is that if I'm, you know, a, a, a farmer or a rancher and I have some, some cattle to, to graze, I would rather graze them in the commons where they can eat grass for free and then my own private land I can dedicate to a garden or, you know, uh, other sorts of private agricultural produce. But as a result of everybody making that same calculation and all of the cattle in the village being sent to the common to graze, uh, the grass gets eaten down to nothing and the grass, and the, you know, the, the top cover gets, gets pounded down and turns to dust and mud and all the topsoil blows away. And before you know it, we've essentially destroyed this open, lush, um, commonly shared green space because of overuse. And that is the, the sort of nugget at the at the heart of the tragedy of the commons, that when we share a resource in common, particularly a, a renewable resource, there's the possibility that we might overuse that resource in such a way that destroys the resource's value going forward into the future. And so the solution to the tragedy of the commons isn't research in the way that um, we could maybe sort of outrun the Malthusian trap. Instead, it's to find a way to manage and control usage in a way that, that makes things sustainable long term. Uh, there's currently, I think, a, a really good example of this, of um, where we're seeing this tragedy of the commons 
problem playing out. And it also has sort of an element to the Malthusian trap in that as global population has grown, demand for fish has grown as well. Um, and we're to a point now where it's possible that we could consume um, essentially the, the viable stocks of fish in, in the Earth's oceans. Um, and this you know, has a Malthusian trap component to it. It has a tragedy of the commons component to it because international waters are sort of open as we've talked about for fishing from folks from all over the world. And as a result, we have this tragedy of the commons where everybody collectively can draw from this pool of fish in, in the Earth's oceans. Um, but we might draw so heavily that we end up damaging or destroying fish populations as we've seen with bluefin tuna in the Pacific um, over the years. And I'll be posting um, a link to some, some podcasts and, and videos that kind of talk about this problem of, of global fish stocks. Um, but as a result, there's been sort of this, this push to try to get ahead of this, um, to try to figure out some way to get states to rein in consumption, um, that it's no longer sustainable for you know, countries to send their fisher folk out to extract the maximum catch possible. Something needs to be done to make sure that yearly catches um, are held in check to a point where fish are allowed to reproduce and the populations are allowed to, to sustain themselves. So in general, when we're dealing with the problem of a common pool resource, there's three possible strategies you can use. And, and I'll kind of talk through some of these different strategies and what they might look like. So one is to simply privatize the resource, right? So if you have a, a publicly shared forest and you're worried that everybody's gonna go in and you know clear cut the timber and there'll be nothing left within you know a couple of years, one option would be to sell off that forest land so that the owner of that forest can make informed decisions about how to maximize profit over the long term, which presumably means not clear cutting, um, but instead, you know, sustainable forest management so that you have timber and, and lumber available for the foreseeable future. So using property rights or physical barriers can be one mechanism to make sure that a resource is managed in a way that, that works reasonably well. And that works for things like forests where we can divide up land and say, okay, this particular acre of land is belongs to this person and the trees are going to stay put. And so we don't have to worry about trees moving around. With things like wildlife, that's not necessarily the case, right? So fish swim throughout the ocean and cross from the economic zones of one country into the economic zones of another and into international waters. And so you can't, you know, divide up who gets what chunk of fish the way you can forests. Similarly, deer will, will run around and they don't really respect whether or not a forest is privately held or publicly held. And so a second strategy is to use government regulation, right, to police a resource's use to ensure that it's, it's managed in a sustainable way, right? So if you want to hunt deer in the United States, you're going to have to work with your state's game, fish, and parks department to get a license. There are police who specialize in making sure that wildlife populations are not overhunted, right? Fish and wildlife officers, game um, fish and parks officers, those sorts of folks um, who are put in place through the state to make sure that this resource is managed in a sustainable way. Right. So we have one option, which is the free market. We have another option, which is sort of using the power of government. Um, neither of those work particularly well for our problem of fish stocks. Um, and this issue of, of international waters. There is a third strategy, um, and this was identified by uh, an economist slash political scientist by the name of Eleanor Ostrom. And Eleanor Ostrom was really interested in this question of how do people in societies that don't have private property rights the way that we typically have in capitalist economies. How do people in societies where there aren't strong government institutions manage these problems of um, the tragedy of the commons and these common pool resources, the CPRs? Um, are they just doomed to face the tragedy of the commons or have people figured it out? And what she found is that people in non-capitalist societies where there aren't private property rights set up, where there's not um, a government structure in place, actually do really well at managing um, common pool resources through what she describes as a common pool resource regime. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of run you through this. And again, I think that this is a useful way to think about global cooperation in general. Um, and I think it fits with that idea that we, we talked about earlier of horizontal governance. So what Ellen Ostrom found is that human beings throughout history and around the world today are able to solve the common pool resource problem, the tragedy of the commons, by establishing 
this this compool resource regime. And she identified things that are common to all of these, these, these regimes. And so one of them is that there's defined boundaries around the system, right? So if you're managing um, fish stocks in a lake, right, you have a defined sense of like who's able to draw from that lake, right? So there might be four or five different villages around that lake and they're all drawing from the fish. That works. It doesn't work if that lake is visited um, by people from all over the place and who just pop in and then leave and aren't part of any sort of system. So you need sort of a defined boundary around that system. A second thing that you need is to have some level of elastic demand. Uh, it's again an economist sort of term, which means that we can ramp up or ramp down our consumption of a good and we have the flexibility to do that, right? So as long as there's a situation where we can say to people, stop fishing from the lake and they won't starve to death, that can work. If we reach a point where if people don't fish from the lake, they will starve to death, nothing that you put in place is going to be able to manage that problem. So you have to have the ability to ramp up or ramp down consumption as needed. Elasticity, I guess. Um, third, you need a collective decision-making process, right? Um, to determine how much you're gonna take from the lake um, or the forest or whatever the common pool resource that you're managing is, right? So this can't be top-down, it needs to be a collective process where people feel like they have a stake, where they can have their voice heard and they feel like they're part of that system. So um, democratic in the very most basic sense of um, sort of communities coming together and deciding collectively how to, how to manage the problem. Um, you need some sort of enforcement mechanism, right? There needs to be some sort of punishment or sanctions if people violate that collective decision, right? And so one way to think about, you know, enforcement mechanisms might be, um, you know, the games fish and parks officer, you know, seizing your, your boat or arresting you or fining you. And that, that, can work, that works as punishment, but oftentimes punishment is, is much more subtle and much more social, right? It might be, you know, your neighbors knocking on your door after you come in off the lake with, you know, an excessively large catch of fish and saying, hey, we, we noticed that you were taking way more fish than is probably sustainable and way more than we all agreed to and way more than you all agreed to and you're not really playing by the rules and we see you and we're judging you and we're disappointed in you. And that kind of social pressure of just your friends and neighbors knocking on your door and telling you knock it off ends up being really effective. Um, people respond to that. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about enforcement mechanisms in the international system, that one of the mechanisms that gets used is peer reporting or even self-reporting, right? Where somebody will say something nasty about a state on the internet. Such and such country is not complying with their stated obligations under inter international law. And while that doesn't really bite in the way that, you know, a jail term fights, that kind of peer pressure, that kind of social pressure dynamic does seem to work pretty well at getting people to alter their behavior. You need some sort of dispute rec resolution mechanism, right? If one village thinks that it's, you know, not being given a fair shot to take its catch from the, the lake, or if it feels another village is cheating, there needs to be some way to resolve that, right? Whether that's a local council, or whether that's something like the International Court of Justice, if we're sort of scaling this up to an international level, that needs to be in place as well. And then there needs to be local control with higher level coordination. So again, with our example of we've got a lake with four villages, you need some mechanism for all those villages to talk to each other, but it shouldn't be sort of a centralized thing that's dictating all of this. A lot of the local, a lot of power needs to be delegated to local decision makers and to local communities, but those local communities need to be in coordination, right? And so again, we're not thinking about some sort of heavy top-down approach. We're thinking about a very situationally based system, each village making its own decisions about how they're going to follow things through and just working toward a common goal. And I think that when we talk about um, some of the global efforts at, at resolving climate change or addressing climate change, uh, I think it's useful to come back to this idea of local control with higher level coordination as, as a useful framework. And so I would maybe suggest to you that a lot of what we think about uh, as global governance is really just sort of a system of trying to replicate common pool resource regimes on a global scale in a way that works within a state system.